In this video, we are going to go over the contents of the Complementary Relation Contrastive Distillation paper. Let's just start with its abstract. The main focus of this paper is on knowledge distillation, which mainly has to do with, the trans, uh, with transferring the representation ability from a teacher model to a student model. in order to perform the distillation. The works in this area have focused either on distilling a individual sample representation or to try to preserve the intersample similarities. This paper mainly focuses on the intersample relationships and proposes an efficient method to preserve that. The proposed model is called CRCD or Complementary Relation Contrastive Distillation. They focus on two main components of feature values and feature gradients in order to estimate mutual relations and focus on an anchor-based distillation by using the anchor student relations and optimizing it according to the corresponding anchor teacher relationships. Mathematically, they try to maximize the lower bound of mutual information between the distribution of anchor teacher relations and the corresponding anchor student relation distribution. The objective function that they use allows them to distill both the sample representations and to preserve the intersample relations. And they empirically validated the efficacy of the proposed method. Knowledge distillation by transferring the ability to represent samples from a teacher model to a student model can help us with the knowledge distillation problem, which is either you have a very large and computationally expensive uh, network, let's say a big neural network, and that would be your teacher model. And then you try to use this teacher model to have a student model, which is presumably smaller, uh, do the same thing that this does to a uh, to a great extent of similarity and another in another example you could consider a large collection of different models and you want to do an assembling and then have a single model uh, be guided by the ensemble of several large models or several models so as you can see knowledge distillation has a lot of uh, applications in the deep learning world one of the first works in this domain is distilling the knowledge in a neural network by Hinton and colleagues, uh, in which they treat each dimension in the representation that they are trying to distill as containing independent information. The other work, which is more similar to this work, is contrastive representation uh, distillation work, which is the reference 41 of this paper. And in that, the assumption is that these representations are hierarchical and the objective is to capture the correlations and uh, to find out the higher order dependencies for each one of the individual data points corresponding to a sample. The objective is similar to, th to this paper, but uh, instead of focusing on the intersample relations, they focus on the individual sample representations. And they use a family of different contrastive objectives in order to maximize the lower bound you, you know, in that sense, it is similar to this paper that they are trying to maximize the lower bound of mutual information. But this time, uh, for this paper, the mutual information is computed between the teacher representations and student representations. Whereas in this paper that we're discussing today, um, this mutual information is computed between the uh, distribution of anchor student uh, relations and the corresponding anchor teacher relations. In addition to the individual representations of the data points corresponding to different samples, preserving the relationships is also an important criteria in order to have uh, generalizable uh, representations for the task and for the tasks at hand. Uh, to understand this better, we can look at the teacher space on the left and the student space for the student model on the right. And Let's say that we randomly sample points and whenever uh, we are supposed to contrast them negatively, um, we will push them away and otherwise pull them closer. It is pretty possible that something like that can break the latent structures 
and kind of change how neighboring points in the tissue space are located with respect to and with respect to each other uh, when it comes to the corresponding points in the student space. The paper then goes on to discuss several works, including these that have investigated that transferring the mutual similarity instead of the actual representations is actually better for distilling knowledge and um, transferring the information to the student model. What they do is to basically um, estimate the relationships in the teacher space and then try to approximate such mutual similarities uh, that have been observed in the teacher space in the student space. Most of the time they try to use something like L2 loss or uh, callback liver divergence in order to facilitate this process. The way this paper works is that it focuses on the teacher space and for each point it picks a neighboring example which is going to act as an anchor, so let's say it's going to be an anchor point, and computes the relation between the anchor point and uh, the actual point. And then this relation is going to guide the relation that is going to be observed in the student representat representation space. In the paper, there are three main merits associated with the proposed method. First is the simultaneous optimization. This means that according to this method of knowledge distillation, when you pick a point in the teacher space and then when you pick one of the neighbors in the teacher space as the anchor, and when you try to make the relationship of the student representation of the original point and its relation with the anchor to be similar to, the, to its relation, to the relation of that anchor and the point in the teacher space, what actually happens is that the representation of the student space is also going to be optimized. The second uh, merit is that the anchor student is going to be better than the student uh, uh, student student representation that has been uh, the focus of the, some of the previously mentioned works. The reason why is that when you are considering the relation this way, you have a pair, one of which is going to be a lot more robust than the other one. If you have a, if you have both the points from the student space in the beginning, when um, the the student model is not really good at representing the data points, uh, this is going to cause some inconsistencies in the outcome. And three is some notion of regularization, meaning that every time you pick a point, you're going to pick one of the random, uh, one uh, one of the neighboring points of it. So there's going to be a lot of different relationships. Uh, helping to guide the student representation of that point. Therefore, it is going to be helpful in kind of introducing some diversity in the training procedure and making the training more robust. To go back to what their model actually is, um, this figure, which is figure one in the paper, is actually a pretty interesting one. So one of the main important uh, differences between this work and other works in this area is that Instead of focusing on the individual representations, they are focusing on preserving the relationships and hoping to preserve latent structures between uh, the data points in the representation space. Um, and one other thing about their work is that instead of focusing on things such as cosine similarity or simpler losses, they are going to introduce subnetworks to learn uh, better representations uh, regarding the relationships. And they are also going to use feature values in addition to feature gradients in order to uh, obtain more information in this, er in this uh, area. Okay, let's go through the pipeline introduced in this paper. Let's first uh, consider that we have a teacher model here and we will have a student model right here. And when we have an input observation, it's going to be represented by both of these models, mainly the path through the teacher model and the path through the student model. We are going to have the feature values and feature gradients for both of these models. So let's go through some of the uh, preliminary mathematics of this paper. So we're going to have a teacher network and a student network, which are going to take the observation of the entity, which is, for example, xi or xj, and are going to give us, for example, if we consider xi passing through uh, the, tar uh, the teacher network, it's going to give us this representation for xi. And it is going to go through the student model as well, which is going to give us this representation. 
Now we have a relation which is in the teacher space, and we denote it as R I J T, which is uh, consistent with the notation in the paper. And this is going to be a vector which is going to be computed by a subnetwork introduced in this pipeline, which is able to learn uh, more complicated relationships. We also have, so this was computed by subnetwork MT, and there's also a subnetwork MTS, which is going to take two data points from different representation spaces, meaning that it's going to, for example, take uh, the target representation of XI and the student uh, representation of uh, XJ, and then it's going to output the TS similarity for example I and example J, which on its own, given that these two are coming from um, different representation spaces and uh, given the consistency that the objectives in this paper are trying to enforce, this is going to cause the student model to actually improve its representations in order to uh, preserve the important information related to the observation X. Assuming that the empirical data distribution is PX, the sampling procedure in order to obtain the conditional marginal distributions of P uh, target target relationships, teacher space teacher space relationships given this, uh, and the teacher student relationships are going to be as follows. We're going to sample X, I, and X, J from the data set, and then R, I, J, T, which is going to be sampled, is going to be computed by passing the teacher space representation of both to the um, target and teacher space teacher space relationship estimator. Likewise, for the student teacher uh, relationships, you're going to sample two data points and then The RTSMN, which is going to indicate the teacher space to student space relationship of data points M and N, is going to be what subnetwork MTS is going to return after taking it the teacher representation of XM and the student representation of XN. Note that these two are coming from two different representation spaces. Similar to that, in order to uh, sample points for the joint representations of RT and RTS conditioned on X is going to be modeled by sampling two points from the data set for which RIJ is what empty network computes for target representation of both points and the TS is going to take the target representation of XI and student representation of xj, this is xi by the way, and give us rij of t and s. Now the objective is to maximize the mutual information between these relationships, meaning the teacher-teacher and teacher-student relationships of points, mainly the anchor-teacher, anchor-to-point uh, relationships in teacher space and the teacher-student space, which is going to be computed as First, we're going to have the logarithm of joint probability of RTRTS and the multiplication of these probabilities, basically the expected value of this on points sampled from the PRT RTS as described before. Let's compute the lower bound on this mutual information. To do so, first let's define the latent variable C, which is going to be connected to a distribution Q, which works like this. If you have C equal one, this indicates that the points have been sampled from the joint distributions RT and RTS. This means that in the sampling procedure that we described before, the same pair xi, xj is used for 
RT and uh, RTS. If, however, C is zero, then this means the two relationships that are sampled are sampled uh, using two different pairs, and mainly they are sampled from the multiplication of the marginal distributions. In this work, the authors have used one uh, relative pair, relative being C is going to be uh, 1, and N pairs with C equals 0. This indicates that if we go over Q, this posterior is going to be this probability given that this times n prt prts which this value is a smaller than prt rts n prt prts taking the logarithm from both sides will lead to logarithm of q c1 or this posterior being smaller than minus log n plus log of p r t r t s or the joint probability of both relationships and then p r t and p r t s meaning the independent uh, multiplication of the marginal distributions now taking the average of these two mainly applying E of um, sorry about that applying E of P RTRTS on this on both sides what we are going to have is that this side is going to be the mutual information and then log n plus log q c being 1 given rt and rts averaged over this space is going to be a lower bound so when it comes to considering q of the c1 on RT and RTS, conditioned on RT, RTS. There's no knowledge about the actual distribution of this. Therefore, the authors have tried fitting a parameterized model called edge, which takes inputs of this space to a real value between zero and one, which is going to be associated with the Q, C equals one uh, conditioned on RT and RTS. Therefore, the log likelihood, which they show as this, is going to be the average on this probability of log edge over the random variables of uh, points sampled from uh, two relation spaces, plus n this time we have to deal with c equal zero and logarithm of one minus h rt rts so this is a log likelihood of the parameterized model h i'm sorry log likelihood of the sample data under uh, parameterized model h so this maximum likelihood is going to be maximized and considering that we know that um, from the previous discussion that given the mutual information RT, RTS, we are going to have to lower bound this log n plus E of QC equal 1. Um, given RT, RTS. Sorry about that, Q, 
RT RTS given C equal one, which is similar to P RT RTS or the joint distribution, meaning the sampling points, uh, results in computing the RT and RTS from the same pair X I X J. So this was used in computing the average of this part. And we had n irrelevant pairs, meaning that this time your sampling points, I'm sorry, so up until this part, part was like the definition of the lower bound that we have. Now consider this additional term as well. So this is related to the n irrelevant pairs that we had. Now this time the probability distribution used for averaging comes from RTRTS, given that C is 0, not 1. And the value that is going to be averaged over is going to be logarithm of 1 minus uh, the output of the parameterized model H on RT and RTS. Now given that this value here is going to be negative, this indicates that I of RT RTS is going to be larger than log n plus ih. So this way we related this lower bound or a lower bound to the log likelihood of the parameterized model of the sample data over uh, under the parameterized model h. So this is the log likelihood and this is log n and this is another lower bound. Now let's look at the relation contrastive loss which is going to help us uh, with training um, the pipeline. So one thing that we have is that we have the parameterized function h that we discussed before and we have the teacher space relation rt and teacher student space relations rts and we had the teacher model student model and we also had mt and mts which are the subnetworks that have to also be trained given all of these the relation contrastive loss is going to be uh, receiving edge student model and the two subnetworks for computing the relations and it's going to be so first we sample the relative uh, relevant pairs and then compute this plus minus n times this time irrelevant pairs, n irrelevant pairs, and we're going to have 1 minus h rt rts. This is going to be the relation contrastive loss. So given this definition, it is clear that MTS is the subnetwork that has to compute the anchor student relationship. This means that you have xi and you have xj, and what you will have is that you are going to pass xi to a teacher network. You're going to get vt xi. And for xj, you're going to use student network and you're going to get the student network representation of it. And then what you have is going to be the RTS R, RNJ, which is going to be this. You're going to pass the teacher representation of xi and student representation of xj to this subnetwork, which results in a weight being multiplied by this format. So you have two sets of weights. You're going to basically bring them into some auxiliary space and then uh, subtract them from each other and then use the difference, pass it to a nonlinearity and another weight. And this is going to give you uh, this representation. Similar to that, for the anchor teacher relations, you're going to use RT of XI and XJ, which is going to be computed similarly as follows.
One thing to note is that, first of, first of all, we have subnet forks instead of things as simple as cosine similarity in this framework. Therefore, they claim that high dimensional uh, relation computations can help with more accurate representation of structural information of the deep representations in those semantic spaces. Now, the representations that can be used in this format can either, for example, be the features or gradients. And for each one of those, the relation contrastive loss can be used. And if both of the relation contrastive losses for features and gradients be optimized simultaneously, it's going to be basically the complementary relation. And uh, uh, these two elements can both be utilized in, in the same loss function. Similar to approaches such as momentum contrasts or things like that, uh, they are using a buffer um, and they are storing uh, features and gradients. And the end feature gradients that are going to be used as negative samples are going to be retrieved from a buffer that is going to be updated as the training sequence is uh, proceeding. To make the representations better, they also use the knowledge distillation loss, which is computed as follows. In this formula, sorry, in this formula, this is cross entropy. These rho is the temperature, and these are going to be the pre softmax logits. So the final loss in the framework is going to be this. We have one loss for classification. We have the knowledge distillation loss, relation contrastive based on features, and relation contrastive based on gradients, which in this paper they have used alpha 1 and beta 1 equal beta 2 to be 0.5, namely they have averaged these two losses. Now let's go over the experiments that they have had. They've used the Cypher 100 data set, which contains over 6,000 images for 100 classes. There are 500 and 100 images per class. Um, and you can see in this table that uh, the relation contrastive loss is going to lead to superior performance. This part contains important information about the parameter settings. So for Cypher, the mini batch was set to 64, one GPU. Uh, standard uh, gradient uh, descent has been used with weight decay and momentum of 1e minus 4 and uh, 0.9 respectively. Learning rate and the schedule of strategy was following this paper and was included in the supplementary material. So overall, they have been using 64 and one GPU. And for the ImageNet dataset, that, which is another dataset that they have used, they have used the batch size of 256 in 8 GPUs, meaning 32 per GPU. And the standard training setting for the ImageNet has been followed. And the relation dimensions for MTS and MT has been 256 dimensions, uh, which is something that has been set empirically. In Table 2, they have went over the testing accuracy on Cypher 100 with different critic function edges. So IM stands for identity mapping, linear projection, LP, and nonlinear projection, MP. And the results have been shown here. And apparently, uh, for example, on ResNet 50 and VGG8, as teacher and student, uh, when they have been using uh, linear projection with 128 dimensions, uh, the output is going to be superior to everything else. To show the effectiveness of their relation modeling method, they have compared it with several methods that have been using some low dimensional relation measurements, mainly reference 32, 34, 43, and 33. Going back to the results, we can see that the other methods have not uh, done as good as uh, this method is done. 
To show the impact of the complementary relationship, this bar plot has been used, and we can see that the green plot and the green bar, which is corresponding to the complementary relation uh, distillation, uh, is going to lead to superior performance in all these three cases. Another interesting table is table 4 that shows that the relation contrastive loss is going to lead to better performance compared to other losses that have been used in uh, this domain. Tables 5 and 6 also show that this method is going to improve the state of the art over um, this, uh, in this domain. And that's it for this CVPR paper. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video and thank you so much.